Hi everybody, welcome. <coughs> welcome. Am I coming through all right? Sounds good? Yeah. Welcome to the Wolf Humanity Center. I'm Jim English. I'm the director of the, uh, of the center. Um, I want to thank also our uh, co-sponsor uh, tonight, which is um, uh, partly myself, um, Price Lab for Digital Humanities. It's kind of nice to thank myself, but really the thanks go to Stuart Varner, uh, the managing director of, of the Price Lab, and I'm so pleased to be working with, uh, with Stuart here on, on the DH initiatives at Penn. Uh, amazingly, at least uh, to me, with my increasingly tenuous grasp of time and its passing, um, this is the last event in the fall semester for us in the Afterlife series. We've, uh, we've already um, blasted through a semester's worth of uh, really fantastic um, lectures and events. We do sometimes manage to squeeze in another one between the Thanksgiving week and exam week, but this year that's not happening. Um, Happily, there's a lot more of afterlives uh, still to come in the spring term. Uh, we've got the end of our culture film series here in the museum uh, uh, in the middle of January, and then we start a really rich series called uh, Re Reviving and Reviewing the Race Film. Um, that runs for four weeks um, at International House. We have a staged reading of the play after this, What's Left to Write? followed by a performance by the Daedalus Quartet of the late Beethoven masterpiece around which that play uh, revolves. Uh, two important writers are speaking about their work next term. The Haitian-American author Edwidge Danticat is coming. She's going to talk about, uh, she's sort of uh, obsessed with death as a topic, um, as she acknowledges, and she's going to talk about death and writing and race and freedom. Um, and then we also have environmental scientist and genre-bending novelist Lydia Millet. I don't know if anyone knows her work, but it's, uh, it's, it's really fun, uh, amazing writer. Um, and she's going to talk about environmental science and the post-apocalyptic novel. So we have those two events. A scholar from MIT is coming to talk about the future of meat eating after the rise of lab-grown meat. Um, and we're going to celebrate the grand opening of the museum's Middle Eastern galleries here, or I should say reopening. Um, uh, which is in, uh, in, in April, and we're going to celebrate with some uh, uh, special tours, uh, small tour groups for, for uh, Wolf Humanity Center, uh, people who, who reserve a spot in those tours, and then a lecture by our colleague Holly Pittman, who's going to talk about burial practices um, in, uh, and, and, and beliefs in the afterlife in early Mesopotamia. So um, that's not everything. That's just uh, like a, a teaser uh, trailer um, of the event. So uh, do take a look over the holidays at our website and see what we've got coming up. And I hope we'll see many of you back in the new term. Uh, as you know, if you've been coming this, this semester uh, for putting the whole series together, the Afterlife series, we have to thank Emily Wilson my colleague in the Classics Department, who is also the Chair of Comparative Literature. Emily's scholarly work is, is all about living on and living after in, in various ways. And as a translator, she's been extending the lives of classical texts um, by Euripides, uh, Seneca, and others. Her translation of Homer's Odyssey, if you haven't heard, if you haven't been reading the newspapers or um, listening to your radios, uh, her translation of Homer's Odyssey just came out last week. First into English by a woman translator. Um, it's been uh, vigorously celebrated in uh, many media outlets. It currently sits atop Amazon, and it's the number one uh, ancient or classical work that they are selling. I expect it's going to remain in that spot through the gift giving season and well yeah. beyond. <laughs> so, that's how for years uh, beyond. So um, please welcome Emily Wilson back to the podium. She will introduce Catherine Hill. So I'm thrilled to be able to introduce to Penn and the Wolf Humanities Center, Professor Catherine Hales, who's a distinguished professor of literature at Duke University. Dr. Hales has published 10 books and over 100 peer-reviewed articles. Her research has been recognized by a Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Endowment for Humanities Fellowships, and zillions and zillions more awards and fellowships. Too many to list here. 
She won the, won the Renee Wellick Prize for the best book in literary theory for how we became post-human. And also the Suzanne Langer Award for outstanding scholarship for writing machines. She teaches courses on experimental fiction, literary and cultural theory, finance capital and culture, science fiction, contemporary American fiction. She's won two teaching awards and held appointments at Princeton, <coughs> Chicago, and Durham University UK, and <coughs> others. Her landmark book, which we're going to hear more about today, How We Became Post-Human, has had a huge impact across the post-humanities and humanities research. Hales argued that the post-human view is one that values information over materiality, mind over body, and knowledge over consciousness. This concept turned out to be very resonant 20 years ago and also ahead of its time. I hope we're going to hear more today about how the concept of the post-human is even more relevant today than it ever has been. Hales promises to sketch a history of the post-humanities from their beginnings in the 1940s to the recent expansion through new cognitive technologies and discuss the likeliest paths for future development. So I'm very much looking forward to the talk and I hope you'll join me again in welcoming Kathleen Hales. Thank you. Thank uh, the uh, Humanities Center for the invitation to be here, Jenny English in particular, and Emily for that uh, very nice introduction. So um, thank you all for coming as well. Uh, this is a lovely setting. I, I was here almost exactly one year ago um, and gave a talk uh, also on some of my new work. So tonight I will try to recap just a small part of that talk and take us into new directions. So one simple way to think about how large intellectual configurations happen is as a kind of dynamic between a system and here, of course, we see the frontispiece for Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. And you see the large figure of the monarch composed of all the smaller, uh, smaller entities, or of the individual. So that leads us to a question of, of alternating foci. The system produces the individuals, of course, but then also the individuals produce the system. So if we think about this dynamic in literary criticism, we could go back to the 1950s for the new criticism, and this was a mode of criticism very much focused on the individual object, typified for us by Cleanne Brook's uh, famous book, the well wrought urn, a phrase from Keats. But at the same time, John Gilray in Cultural Capitalism has placed the, um, the new criticism in a systemic view. And he makes the argument that new criticism, even though it seemed remote from politics with its focus on the single artistic object, in fact, was deeply implicated in political quietism during a time when it was dangerous to be an activist during the McCarthy period. So this is a resituating of a mode of inquiry based on the individual object back into systemic dynamics with a very, um, a very disquieting implication. So, um, Following uh, Guillory's work, Cultural Capital, we then, in literary criticism, plunged into a period where systemic dynamics seemed primary with Marxism, feminism, uh, deconstruction, and so forth. But now, recently, with the work of Sharon Marcus and Stephen Best, we're beginning to see a movement back to the individual object, the argument that um, 
We are tired of ideological readings, symptomatic readings. Let's go back to aesthetics. Let's go back to looking at the surface. This uh, seems to have a mind of its own here. <clears throat> Let's go back to the surface. Let's go back to the single object. So once again, we see that interplay between the system and the individual, now with seemingly a swing, a swing back to the individual. So this brings me back now <coughs> to the post-human. And nearly 20 years ago, I published the book that Emily referred to, How We Became Post-Human. And in that book, I was referring to a specific configuration of the human that we inherited from the Enlightenment. And it was the breakup of that Enlightenment configuration that I chose to call post-human. So that included uh, challenges to the idea that hu the human is basically a rational creature that human beings are autonomous, autonomous agents, that human beings have free will, and that the preeminent psychic quality of humanness is consciousness. So all of those configurations, all of those attributes, came under a strong challenge in the 1990s from a variety of sources partly through theoretical critiques. So deconstruction, Derrida and Foucault talked about the end of so-called man, and by man they meant generally the liberal humanist subject. Post-colonial and decolonial theory began to challenge the idea of the autonomous subject. Animal rights from another angle was challenging the idea that humans were the preeminently rational species. Cyborg subjectivity was challenging the notion that humans had free will. And neuroscience was making inroads on the idea that consciousness was the characteristic most typical of human experience. But at the same time, there were challenges emerging from the technical side as well. And these included robotics, which were building artificial mechanisms, which in some uh, captured some aspects of human existence. Artificial life, uh, computational simulation of multi-agents working together to create an emergent society. Um, computational media. Increasingly, uh, algorithms were taken over fun taking over functions previously done only by humans. Embedded cognition was arguing against uh, rationality as being the primary human faculty and arguing instead that cognition was a full body process and also extended into the environment through all kinds of cognitive supports. And then um, algorithmic language processing, which was seeming to undercut the idea that uh, the characteristic of humans was the ability to process language. And increasingly, programs were being created, such as the never-ending language learning program at Carnegie Mellon which reads text in the wild on the internet 24-7, categorizes it, and draws inferences from it. So now, nearly 20 years after I published the post-human book, I think we're at a point where we can look at liberal humanism and not simply discard it wholesale, but acknowledge that it had some important achievements and try to find ways to preserve some of those achievements while still moving forward past liberal humanism in its traditional form. So here you see Eleanor Roosevelt holding up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, I use that as an example of one of the achievements of liberal humanism because it was uh, arguing that there was an intrinsic value to all human life and uh, basing a political ideology on that. So the post-human challenge, I think, now as we move into the new millennium, 
is to uh, keep these achievements, but at the same time improve the flaws which were so evident 20 years ago. And what were some of these flaws and what are the theoretical initiatives trying to do today? Overcoming anthropocentrism. So acknowledging a wider view of species on the planet that is not solely focused on humans, including non-humans in the way that we think about in the way that we think about uh, ecology and our place on the planet, accounting for our historical presence, which means acknowledging everything that uh, humans have done and are doing to the planet, and finding ways to extend and incorporate cognition in ways that go beyond simply consciousness. So for me, these are key questions thinking about how we can uh, strive toward an affirmative post-humanism. So in the post-human book 20 years ago, I think I did a reasonable job of showing uh, how the liberal humanist idea was being deconstructed. I think I did a much uh, more tenuous job on arriving at some kind of affirmative vision of post-humanism, and that's where my work has gone since then. So these, for me, are key questions. Is post-humanism a way of thinking or a way of being? Is post-humanism historical or trans-historical? Does post-humanism emerge in the first instance from the individual or the system? So now I'm going to show you some different approaches to these fundamental questions. So one of the, one of the theorists who has uh, been working toward an affirmative post-humanism now for several years is Rosie Bradotti, a Dutch theorist. And she has written about what she calls the nomadic or the sustainable subject. So she is very influenced by the theories of Gilles Deleuze um, in Thousand Plateaus and elsewhere. And we can think of Deleuze and Guattari's Thousand Plateaus as proposing a kind of non-system. And Bradotti is arguing that to increase our sense of humanness, it's necessary to open ourselves to the dynamic chaos that Deleuze is so eloquent at depicting. So her version of post-humanism then is trans-historical. It doesn't depend on being in this specific year or this specific century. It's a way of being that would be accessible to anyone at any time. She retains a strong emphasis on the subject, so she is oriented toward the individual, and insofar as she explores systemic dynamics, she does so through a Deleuzean paradigm. Uh, so for her, trans or post humanism is a way of being. So in a certain way, our post-humanism is like designing a sailboat. So I once talked with a sailboat designer, and he said, well, there are no mysteries in sailboat designing. You have a number of known parameters, and you try to find the sweet spot of maximizing those in different ways. So for example, speed and stability. The more you maximize for speed, the less stable the vessel becomes. The more you maximize for stability, the slower it becomes. Mm -hmm. So there's no mystery. It's just a matter of trying to work with these different parameters to achieve, achieve what you want to achieve. And in a certain way, post-humanism is like that. There are different parameters that different people try to maximize. We saw Bradotti's approach of trying to open the subject to a dynamic chaos, but as she says, holding it still. So her idea of the ideal nomadic or sustainable subject is a self that has partly dissolved 
and yet still not lost its sense of individuality or selfhood. Carrie Wolf, pictured here, has a very different version of how he wants to maximize the parameters to achieve a post-human configuration. So in his book, What is the Post-Humanities, Wolf gives us uh, an exploitation of Nicholas Luhmann's systems theory. So he's focusing in the first instance on systems, not on the individual. And in fact, in Luhmann's theory, the individual hardly exists at all. So it's a complex theory, but to give you a short version so you get a feeling for what this theory is, Luhmann thinks about reality, social reality, as being divided into systems and an environment. And the environment is always richer uh, in information than the system is. So the system has a dynamic with the environment where it's always at risk of breaking down because of the greater complexity of the environment relative to the system. So the system responds to this challenge of a richer environment by trying to recreate some of that complexity within itself. And it does so by subdividing itself into multiple subsystems and uh, opening itself to this complexity through a dynamic of increasing differentiation. But once the system has differentiated and therefore become more internally complex, it goes back to an exchange with the environment and this is a continuing dynamic of taking more and more of the external complexity into itself through increasing uh, differentiation. So, Terry Wolf is proposing that this Luhmannian idea of uh, opening oneself to increasing complexity through differentiation is fundamentally a post-human move. Now, he has a complex argument about how this uh, kind of meets Derrida coming from the other side that I won't go into, but I'll just point out that according to this dynamic, Post-humanism is only weakly historical. It's historical in a kind of second instance because the way that a system differentiates itself is partly dependent on its historical uh, circumstances. It has no strong relationship to technology at all. And for Wolf, post-humanism is not primarily a way of being Rather, it is a way of thinking. So now I'll come to my own work and uh, provide some of the answers that I would supply to those questions. So I mentioned I was here a year ago, and during that time I talked about my new book called Unthought, The Power of the Cognitive Nonconscious. Um, and in this book, uh, I am trying to present my own version of an affirmative post-humanism. So, for me, post-humanism is deeply related to technology. It is both a way of thinking and a way of being. It's historically situated. So in the way that I think about the post-human, it has everything to do with our historical past, uh, particularly the liberal subject that I was deconstructing in my post-human book. And for me, just because of the way my mind works, it's easiest first to conceptualize the post-human through the individual and then move from the individual into the system. <coughs> So I won't uh, repeat much of the lecture that I gave here last year. I'll just present very quickly a few of the key concepts to give you some idea of the kind of post-humanism that I'm working with in this book. So the catalyst of the book was really some recent discoveries in neuroscience. Uh, about the existence of a level of neuronal processing which happens below 
consciousness, below unconsciousness, and in fact is inaccessible to consciousness. So I call it the non-conscious. Not the unconscious, <coughs> but the non-conscious. And the non-conscious, even though it is inaccessible to consciousness, performs certain functions absolutely essential for consciousness to function. And these functions include sophisticated pattern recognition, which is shown in visual masking uh, experiments and similar types of experiments. One of the functions of the non-conscious is to create a coherent body representation. So uh, we may think that uh, our coherent sense of our own body simply happens, but that's not the case. It actually is an achievement, and that achievement is performed in the, in the cognitive non-conscious. So I'll just give you a quick example of that. If someone touches the top of your head, and simultaneously someone else touches your toe, and you can see that those two touches are simultaneous, you will perceive them as simultaneous. But in fact, it takes about 100 milliseconds longer for the toe touch to reach your brain than the head touch because it has a longer distance to travel through neuronal pathways. So the fact that you can perceive them as simultaneous happens through the power of the cognitive non-conscious. I'll give you another example. This was an experiment done by David Eagleton in a book he calls Brain Time. So um, suppose that you have a video, and the video shows a drumstick striking a drum head, that you see the sight of the strike, and you hear the sound simultaneously. So you perceive them as simultaneous. Now you start messing with the video, and you introduce a time lag between the sight of the drum strike and the sound of the drum strike. So first you interview, introduce an interval of 10 milliseconds, then 20 milliseconds, then 50 milliseconds, up to about 100 milliseconds. And you will still perceive them as simultaneous because they should be simultaneous. And so the non-conscious is making you perceive them as simultaneous even though there's up to a 100 millisecond lag between the sight and the sound. Now you mess further with the video and you suddenly remove the time gap. What do you think you will perceive? Well, what actually happens is you now perceive the sound before the sight. Why? Because the non-conscious has been adding a fudge factor. And if that transition is made abruptly, it continues to add the fudge factor. And so you hear the sound first, and then you see the strike, and then, then it realizes, oh no, now the fudge factor isn't necessary, so we'll eliminate the fudge factor, and you will... Uh, shortly experience them as simultaneous again. So these are some of the functions performed by the cognitive non-conscious. It's been shown to be capable of learning, as in this instance, of drawing inferences and influencing behavior. So why is it important for us to know about the cognitive non-conscious uh, in this decade? Well, this is a little diagram that I made up that I call the cognitive timeline. So over there at zero milliseconds is the start of the stimulus. And long about 100 to 200 milliseconds, your sensory and perceptual systems kick in. Around 200 milliseconds, non-conscious cognition begins operating on those primary uh, sensations and perceptions. Consciousness does not come online until about 500 milliseconds after the start of the stimulus. That's half a second, the so-called missing half second. So you might say, okay, half second, who cares? But in the present uh, technical regime, that half a second between zero and 500 milliseconds is an eternity. 
To give you an example, automated trading algorithms operate on a temporal scale of about five milliseconds. And so this whole area between zero and 500 milliseconds is a human temporal regime that is now being occupied and co-opted by all kinds of technical media. So many people are writing now about affective capitalism. Mm. And what they mean by that is the um, slipping uh, messages underneath the threshold of consciousness to predispose you to certain kinds of responses. For example, sensitivity towards certain kinds of brand names, which when they appear at the, the temporal regime in which consciousness operates, you will have already been preconditioned to notice those because of what is happening under the threshold of consciousness. So in this kind of temporal regime, it's extremely important to know about the kind of processing that non-conscious cognition does before consciousness operates. So if we were to ask, okay, I've used the term cognition several times, what is cognition? Here comes our friend again. <laughs> uh, I was looking for a definition of cognition that would have a low threshold for something to count as cognitive, but be able to scale up to very sophisticated cognitions such as humans enjoy. This is what I came up with. Cognition is a process, so it's not an entity, it's a dynamic process that interprets information in context that connect it with meaning. So what are some of the implications now of this uh, definition? Well, uh, it focuses on acts of interpretation, and in order for interpretation to operate, you have to have more than one choice. If you don't, there's no possibility for interpretation. So interpretation implies choice or selection, and it also implies that cognition is basically an operation of making choices in specific contexts. So one of the implications of this is that all cognitive life forms, by this definition, have some cognitive capacity. Why? Because they sense, they perceive, they interpret, and they attribute meanings to those interpretations in contexts that are specific to them. So I would argue very strongly this applies to all mammals. But even more, I would argue that it implies, applies to something like a single-cell organism, which also receives information from its environment, makes interpretations or selections, for example, moving toward a food source or away, away from a poison or a toxic substance, and that it attributes meanings to those interpretations relevant to its context as a single cellular organism. I would also argue that this means plants are, co are cognitive life forms. A lot of recent research in plant biology has demonstrated the complex ways that plants interpret information from their environment and make decisions or selections that are meaningful to them. Now roughly 99% of the biomass of the planet is our plants. And so it's very consequential whether or not you are willing to say that plants are cognitive as I am. So it also implies that meaning making can occur at a very low, uh, simple level, but it also can quickly scale up to much more complex meanings. So then the role of the cognitive non-conscious in humans um, these are some of the reasons why it's indispensable for consciousness to operate. It's energy efficient. As neuroscientists like to say, consciousness is a glucose hog. When you're consciously working on something, the brain is absorbing a lot of energy resources. The cognitive non-conscious operates at a much faster pace than does consciousness. So as soon as consciousness starts to operate, your reflexes slow way down. 
Uh, one of the roles of the cognitive non-conscious is to keep consciousness from being overwhelmed. If by some evil stroke all of our conscious, all of our non-conscious cognition were to be disabled in this auditorium, everyone here would become psychotic within minutes. <laughs> if you're not awake. And that is because uh, consciousness could not tolerate the floods of information that would be flooding into the brain without being pre-processed pre by non-conscious cognition. So an extremely important function of non-conscious cognition is that it makes results accessible to consciousness if they are appropriate to the context or equally important, suppresses them if they're not. So once we understand how non-conscious cognition operates in humans and other life forms, we now have a basis to compare how non-conscious cognition operates in technical devices. As we know, our popular culture is full of fantasies of conscious machines. As far as I know, there are no conscious machines. And as long as we identify consciousness, with cognition, then we're tempted to think that machines are not capable of thought, as Alan Turing asked 50 years ago, can machines think? But if we break the link between consciousness and cognition, and recognize that cognition happens without consciousness, both in humans and in non-human life forms, then we have the basis to draw a homology between how cognition operates in biological life forms and how non-conscious cognition operates in technical devices. So what do we know about the way non-conscious cognition operates in technical devices? Stuart is here with the Price Lab conducting experiments in digital technologies. So he would be very familiar with this list. That technical devices analyze and recognize patterns. They draw inferences. They're capable of interpreting ambiguous or conflicting information, for example, like in satellite uh, surveillance photographs. They keep consciousness from being overwhelmed, and digital humanities is a good example of that. Digital algorithms can read thousands of books, something no single human could do, find patterns in those, and begin to interpret the patterns as well. So we now have non-conscious cognition in humans, non-conscious cognition in technical devices, and these come together in cognitive assemblages. So at this point in the US and in other developed societies, Human life is absolutely dependent on cognitive assemblages. So cognitive assemblages are more or less loose collections of humans and technical devices through which cognitions, interpretations, and meanings circulate. So what are some of these cognitive assemblages? Well, I flew into the airport here. The airport couldn't operate without being a cognitive assemblage because the air traffic is too, in too dense to control through humans alone. So a computational media were suddenly disabled throughout this country, every major airport would have to close. Uh, I mentioned automated trading algorithms. About 75% of all stock trades are now done through automated algorithms. So cognitive assemblages are pervasive in our economic and banking systems. Increasingly, we have robotic factories where they operate as cognitive assemblages, book publishing, and so forth. So in fact, human life in developed countries is now absolutely interwoven with and interdependent upon cognitive, hybrid, human, technical assemblages. So these are some of the reasons why I think if you're going to arrive at a definition of the post-human or an analysis of the post-human, 
it's important to take technology into account. So Nigel Thrift, the British geographer, has written about what he calls the technological unconscious. And what he means by that are our everyday assumptions about how the world works, which are dependent on the kind of technological view in which we live. The speed at which we live our <coughs> lives. The amount of time you estimated it was going to take you to get to the museum tonight. All of those are preconditioned by the kinds of technical infrastructures that form our assumptions both at conscious levels and at unconscious and non-conscious levels. So we're at a period of human history now where the human species is in deep symbiosis with computational media. And as we know, symbiosis for any two species conveys benefits, the symbionts each give something to the relationship, but it also entails risks. Because if one of the symbionts somehow becomes disabled, the other symbiont may in fact be able, unable to continue to exist. So here's a little bit of trivia for you. Did you know that most of the, the majority of cells in your body are not human? They're bacterial. And that means if all the bacteria in your body were to die, you would largely be able to digest most of the food that you eat. And we get a little preview of that when we take antibiotics and wipe out part of our biome. Well, we're now in deep symbiosis in a similar way with computational media. So, <clears throat> The technologies that we've created, I would like to suggest, have presented us with new ways of thinking about the human. And these ways are both defining the human with the technologies, as the transhumanists like to do, and also against the technologies. And it's that latter prospect I'd like to illustrate for us tonight. So we know that humanity has defined itself as the species that is able to use symbols, and in particular, the species that has language. So Terence Deacon's The Symbolic Species sort of summarizes this attitude. But now we're in a period where the cultural conditions are catalyzing a rethinking of the human as something other than the symbolic species, the species with language. Why? What are the cultural catalysts for this kind of rethinking? Well, first is what uh, Dennis Tennant calls the new illiteracy. What is the new illiteracy? Well, you look at your computer screen, and at the site of inscription, you may see text. You may see words. But underlying those words are multiple layers of code. If you're not a coder, those multiple layers of code are inaccessible to you. And even if you are a coder, some levels of that laminate sign or that multi-layer sign, as Tennant calls it, remain inaccessible for legal and proprietary reasons. So according to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you are not allowed to access certain levels of the code that are delivering, say, a proprietary ebook content to you. And if you do access them and try to change them, you're actually breaking the law. So this means every person is in a condition of partial illiteracy. Not complete illiteracy, because we can still read the signs at the site of inscription, but we cannot read the full dimensions, all of the multiple layers of the sign. Robo writing. So we know that certain highly formulated forms of writing, like sports reporting and financial reports and so forth, are now not done by humans. They're done by algorithms. And it's the formulaic repetition of the form that in fact allows this to happen. We also know, thanks to Edward Snowden, that much of our writing, especially in electronic media, is being surveilled. But it's not only being surveilled by the NSA, it's also being surveilled by the corporations who deliver ego content to you. 
So while you're reading your ebook, your ebook is reading you. It knows how far you've read into a book, it knows how long you've taken, it knows what passages you've underlined, it knows where you've paused, it knows where you're stopped reading, and all of this information is being reported back to the corporation and included in their databases. We also know that reading is being manipulated for us by uh, collating filtering algorithms, the form of algorithms that you see when you go on Amazon and it says, we think you will like X, Y, and Z. So I went on Amazon one day to order a book and I always glanced down and it said, you may also like, and it says, you may also like how we became post-human. <laughs> So now I'd like to talk about uh, this, the, one of the cultural imaginative products that is exploring this new illiteracy created for us as we plunge into a technological regime. And it appeared first as iPhone maps that you could download, and it went by the name of the Silent History. So this is what the uh, interface looked like. You could read the archives, which were the different narrative sequences that appeared about twice a week, and you could download when they became available. I don't know what subliminal effect that's having. <laughs> I guess it's preconditioning us to like Pennsylvania. Um, so those are the narrative sequences. Uh, you could read about the condition. So what is the condition? The condition is this, a generation of children is being born that is unable to understand language. They cannot speak language, they cannot understand when it's spoken to them, they cannot write, they cannot read. Instead, they communicate through microfacial gestures. And then you can read the prologue. And we'll read a little section of that Late, uh, later. So only after the download of all the iPhone apps was completed did the print book appear. And so the print book is very much belated. <coughs> Instead of the print book coming first and then a film adaptation being made of it, for example, now we get the iPhone app and then the print book comes later. So this is what I call a post-print uh, book. And I won't have time to go into this tonight, but I would argue the mark of the digital is everywhere apparent in its post-print production. So I call this an echo techno text uh, because, well, maybe I'll just skip that. All right, microfacial gestures. Microfacial gestures are extremely hard to fake. That's because they're just tiny little muscles, but they convey emotions very accurately. And we all produce these without thinking about it. And on a subconscious level, we all understand and read these microfacial gestures. Here we see Tim Roth doing microfacial gestures for six typical emotional states, sadness, contempt, surprise, anger, disgust, fear. I think he's overdoing the fear. <laughs> but the point is that these microfacial gestures have a grammar to them. And if you put them together in sequence, they have a syntax. And so the silent generation, the children who cannot use language or understand language, communicate to one another through microfacial gestures, which the adults only slowly and with great difficulty learn to read, but that the children are extremely facile in uh, being able to discern nuances of meaning conveyed through gesture and through the face, in much the same way that a blind person might develop more acute senses of hearing, the children develop great facility in reading these microfacial gestures. So one of the main questions that the text asks is this. Is the absence of language a terrible disability, or is it any kind of freedom? So in the prologue, we read this. 
Are words our creation, or do they create us? And who are we in a world without them? Are, those, are there wilder, more burdened fields out beyond the boundaries of language, where those of us who are now silent now wonder? We enter and leave the world in silence after all, and everything else is simply how we walk that middle passage. So the central conflict of this narrative um, is about those who want to violently restore language to the silence by implanting devices in their brains that restore language to them. And the central scientist who's working toward that end is August Burnham. So he develops these computational implants, and then the government dictates that silent children have these devices implanted in them at birth. And the silent or the uh, implants allow surveillance because they all go through a central network uh, overseen by Burnham. So he is able to hear the thoughts of any child that has the implants. Not only that, he can also intervene and prevent them from thinking certain things or else uh, emphasize certain things. So, <coughs> So one of, the, um, one of the protagonists of this violence uh, attacks the server farm where uh, all of the implants uh, are coordinated digitally. And when the server farm goes down, the implants all fail at once. And as a result, children who were in, uh, implanted at birth for the first time, are unable to hear their own thoughts in verbal language. And as a result, they go wild. They become wild animals. Their parents uh, try to control them with cattle prods, and they're put in electrified pens because no one can control them. And Burnham is looking at such a child when suddenly uh, a young boy who's a double silent puts on a helmet communicates to all the other children and communicates something to them. This is the effect on the child who's examining a young girl who's just been uh, completely wild. I saw something, a flickering that passed across her features. It was as if I saw her go from animal back to human. I don't believe there is a word in our language or perhaps any language for what I saw on that girl's face. It was the primal spark of a mind recognizing itself. So what is the boy communicating? The essence of what he is communicating is that you are human. You are a thinking being, even though you do not have language. So the boy has no need of a name. He is a silent himself. Both of his parents are silent, but the adults around him named him Slash. And Slash, of course, is a name, but it's also a punctuation mark, dividing both and, either or, and so forth. So Slash operates in that mediating position between two binaries. Um, and eventually we learn that the virus which causes the silent condition is now spreading. And more and more people, including adults, are falling into a condition of silence. So the question the text asks is this. If we can imagine a mutation in the human race that would render us all without language, would we still be human? And if we would be human, what kinds of humans would we be? And this question, I would like to suggest, has been catalyzed by our realization that technical media are taking more over more and more of our language functions. And so language ceases to be a human-only property, but becomes a technical function. And this text is suggesting there's threat as well as benefit in that exchange. So we're all familiar with CAPTCHA technology, and frequently it says, prove you are not a robot. 
And how do you prove you are human and not a robot? Because your superior human pattern recognition enables you to read deformed writing, and then you type the word into the box. Now an algorithm can read it. The algorithm acknowledges that you typed the word into the box. You're now validated as human, but at the price of being co-opted back into the techno-linguistic regime. So my question is, is there a form of writing which resists recapture? If being human means being able to read and produce deformed writing, what kind of human does that imply? So there is a mode of writing which is called acemic writing, dates back to the 7th century in some Zen Buddhist manuscripts. And it's, we might think of the acemic. Scenic, of course, means words or semantics. A is a, is a negating uh, prefix here, so it means without semantics. So we might think of it as a form of writing unconstrained by semantics. So it's not writing as we usually think of it, but using a Grimasian formulation, we may say it's not not writing. It's not writing, but it's not not writing. So this is an example of a scene of writing from the 1950s by one of its 20th century practitioners, Henri Marshall. And you can see that it's parasitic on writing. It forms lines and even paragraphs. And it looks like maybe bad handwriting. We should be able to decipher it. Maybe we've got a magnifying glass. But in fact, no matter how closely you look, you would never be able to recapture these marks into alphabetic symbols. Now, it's not only for alphabetic languages. There's an ancient tradition of acemic calligraphy as well. This is one example. And this is a famous example of what may be a scenic writing. It's a mysterious manuscript uh, that has been dated, carbon dated, to be produced between 1404 and 1438. It consists of 240 pages of vellum. It has colored ink as well as um, black ink. Um, and the mysterious thing about it is that it has 28 symbols which repeat, but no one, no one, including the NSA, has been able to decode this manuscript. The writing script in which it is written is unknown. It looks like it should be writing, uh, but nobody knows what this manuscript means. Nobody has been able to render it into any form of known languages. And this is what it looks like with the individual symbols. So it's a, a mystery and a challenge to cryptographers. Whether it's a scenic or not remains to be seen. And this is an artistic rendering of an a scenic typewriter. So you see that all the keys have been painted over with a scenic symbols. And my favorite is the space bar there. And then the artist has created a page as if it were typed, but in fact the typewriter keys themselves have not been manipulated. It's just an art piece uh, talking about acemic writing. So what, what, why is acemic writing finding a resurgence in the contemporary era? Well, what it suggests is that the future of the human and the future of writing is implied. And to be a condition of print implies partial post-literacy. Not complete illiteracy, but what we might call post-literacy. And that the condition of post-literacy implies a rupture in the human. So that cognitive technologies now are in line with how we think about the human, including to think about how the human can resist a techno-linguistic regime. So what is the contemporary meaning of the acemic? I'd like to suggest that 
It is a form of mark making which resists recapture into the techno linguistic regime. It is an imagination of the human as a species without language, but not without the joy of making marks. And it's another way of decentering the human, constructing the human in such a way that to be human means to resist techno language. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you for your attention. We have time for questions and answers. We have a, uh, a microphone. Margie Guy here will hand you the mic. So if you have a question, just put a hand up and we'll try to get the mic to you promptly. Do you think that um, if we got to the point where we couldn't use technology, uh, we would, you know, what you're saying is we're we're changing as humans, but we're going, if we don't use language, will we go back to the way civilizations were when pre-writing, uh, um, pre-language? Is there a, 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 a you know, possibility of that flavor? So what the text shows us uh, in the silent history is that the silent uh, children develop rituals, they have ceremonies, we see the performance of a wedding, they recognize family bonds, uh, they live in a very simple way, mostly scavenging from what has already been created by the civilization because any kind of large-scale coordination requires some kind of language system in order to coordinate it, but going Going forward into post-literacy is not the same as returning to pre-literacy. So the whole effect of having gone through literacy puts you in a different position than, say, a caveman society would be. But I think your question is, um, is pointing to uh, something that this text wants us to entertain. What would it be like without language? But of course, it's a fiction. <laughs> we're not uh, we're not going to be without language, but it's a it's an interesting exploration of a mode of human which would be highly resistant to any technical form of language. It's a question I uh, debated whether to even ask. I very difficult for me to uh, get into this. I respect it, though. Believe me. So I ask this question. I'm coming here in February to hear the uh, this one of the late Beethoven quartets. I'm not a musician, but I feel very close to it. How will wood? If I gave my old self to understanding this whole concept, how would it improve or deepen, do you believe, my feeling for this music? Well, thank you for that question. That's very specific and therefore, uh, therefore challenging the answer. So um, when you immerse yourself in any kind of sensation, but you mentioned specifically Beethoven music. Um, you're processing that music on multiple levels. You're conscious of it as core, of course. But there are also patterns in that music. And you're processing those patterns non-consciously, as well as consciously. And your non-conscious process, processing sets up certain expectations because it recognizes the patterns. It anticipates what those patterns might do. It gives you a framework of expectations. So you may be surprised if the music is moving in a different direction than you had imagined. You may feel rewarded if it's fulfilling what you thought the next section of the music might do. 
So for you as a thinking person, uh, engaging this framework would give you a deeper appreciation for your total engagement with that music. Not only as an intellectual experience, but an affectual, emotional experience. And it would give you a deeper appreciation for the multiple levels at which you were responding to that experience. Uh, some years ago, we tried uh, international languages, Esperanto, and there have been a whole bunch of that. Why is it that the language seems to be more compartmentalized in cultural groups than we ever move towards an international language? Well, I think you could argue that we have a new international language, and that new international language is computer code. And that all of those divisions are now being smoothed out by the kind of translation made possible by data mining, translating any expression in any language into any other expression, uh, any other language. And as you probably know, uh, when you use something like Google Translate, it is not relying on a dictionary or a grammar or syntax. What it's doing is finding a passage in the language you want to translate and finding an equivalent passage in the language you want to transfer to. And so it's a massive data matching project, not a semantic dictionary kind of project. So since we can now get some sense of what people in any language are saying if they write to us or otherwise presented in digital form, I think it, the likely effect is to make it less necessary to develop a language like Esperanto. So you could say computer code is the new form of Esperanto that we all rely on when we receive communications from someone in a language we don't speak and so forth. It was really stimulating the talk, and I think ending with the AC <coughs> was kind of a, a curveball that took me by surprise. But I, uh, I guess the question, the, the question actually goes in a different direction, which is you, you started off by contextualizing um, the well-wrought urn in a particular Cold War, early Cold War moment of McCarthyism. When I think about the the political context of uh, how we became post-human, I think about that political moment, I think for a lot of people it was a moment of, of there was a sort of liberatory potential in the post-human that was linked to that post-Cold War moment, right, in the 1990s when a lot of these technologies seemed like they were, well, you could go in different directions, you could go to kind of, you could endorse the neoliberal, you could say this is freeing us to, to, to fulfill our kind of subjectivity in any kind of way, or you could see the post-human as a way of pushing back against that moment. But in any case, there was a certain liberatory potential, I think, at that moment linked to that really specific political, geopolitical context. I don't know exactly how to describe our political context right now, <laughs> but it's different. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and, you know, so, keep it short, but um, how do you see the kind of do you see an emancipatory potential in, in this idea of the post-human? Did you see it then? Do you see it now? And has it changed because that, that bigger cultural context has changed? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, I do see an emancipatory possibility in the post-human, but the kind of emancipatory potential that I see is very different than what the transhumanists see. So for a transhumanist, the emancipatory potential of the post-human is that we will go increasingly into a post-human future in which human bodies become increasingly joined with machines mm. and the ultimate uh, dream is to be able to upload human consciousness into a computer and thereby achieve a form of immortality. Other versions of that are the technological singularity where it's imagined that some 
that uh, mechanical intelligence will surpass human intelligence and that our true descendants will be computers, not other humans. I'm not interested in those visions, although I recognize them as attractive to many people, but rather what I would prefer to think about is not some post-human future which exists in science fiction, but the post-human future that we're already living as we participate in cognitive assemblages. So I think the present technological condition of having human life so entwined with uh, computational media raises a whole host of questions on how these configurations challenge traditional formulations. For example, uh, Maria Hildebrand has a book called The Ends of Law, in which she's arguing that law, in the modern sense, absolutely depends on print. And <clears throat> she identifies three characteristics something has to have to be a law. It has to be written down, you have to be able to break it, and you have to be able to challenge it in court. And her argument is that data-driven agency fulfills none of these three conditions. So when you're prohibited from copying a portion in an e-book into a Word file because of the software imposing that regulation on you, you can't break that law. You can't break that, that uh, prohibition because you can't fool with the software in order to make that possible. Even though the code is written some down somewhere, you can't access it. And theoretically, you could challenge it in court, but it would require such enormous resources to go up against the huge corporate interest that, practically speaking, that's not possible. So then you get a situation where a data-driven agency is increasingly taking the force of law without none of the attributes of law understood in the print regime. So those are the kinds of implications where we see cognitive assemblages are challenging very well-established institutions like law, ethics, and so forth. And to me, the <clears throat> challenge of the post-human is to um, create affirmative ways to go forward without abandoning the cognitive assemblages in which we are so deeply enmeshed. And that involves uh, very complex questions about how uh, how regulations are to be forged in a way that will make this possible, how ethics needs to be rethought when agency is distributed between devices and humans, and so forth. So I think there's an enormous amount of work to be done, but without some vision of an affirmative future toward which we move, I don't see how we can begin to undertake that work. It always seemed to me that the watershed moment was not when a language was developed, because I think humans and non-human creatures have certain sounds that have certain meanings, and other similar creatures can interpret it. But when they develop a written language, how profound and how powerful is the language-human interface is the fact of having a written language and not just a, a language that exists only in sound. Uh, well, there's a lot of, that has been written about oral cultures and uh, the way that oral cultures evolved certain institutions and how those changed with the advent of written language. And of course, Plato worried that writing was going to erode human memory and thought that it was corrosive of what was essentially human, the ability to remember words. So, um, so I'm not sure that you could say being human originated with written language because there were very complicated and rich oral cultures that preceded writing. Classical Greece, Rome would be just some examples of those. Uh, but it is for sure, I think, that the advent of writing did have a pervasive, transformative influence on every culture that adopted it. And that, I think, is true not only culturally, but even neurologically.
because some recent research has shown that developing literacy, the ability to read written language, actually changes the neuronal synapses and the networks in the brain. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering um, if you could, well, the question I want to ask is, have we ever been human? <laughs> well, that's so, an excellent question. <clears throat> is the Enlightenment the real subject to which the post like? Yeah, yeah. So what I would there's say... There's always non-conscious cognition and distributed cognition. I guess you get my question. Right. So what I would say is that human is a historical and cultural construct. And that it varies by historical period. And so, um, yes, we've certainly been human. We are still human. But what it means to be human is culturally and historically contingent. And so it's in that sense that post-human pushes against a certain historically contingent idea of what the human was. hear you talk about aspect writing, which is a, um, a you know a practice that just hasn't received the, I think, the critical uh, scholar, scholarly attention that it really deserves. Uh, excuse me, I'm not sure that microphone is on. I'm having a lot of trouble hearing you. It's on. Is it? Okay, me? good. Can you hear me now? No? <laughs> just yell. <clears throat> Oh, that's there we go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was just saying that I'm, I'm very excited that you actually included um, asthmic writing because it's an area that just hasn't been sort of um, hasn't been I think uh, had much attention on it. I'm very curious though. Can you actually just explain a little bit more why you see asthmic writing as being resistant to our to the technological condition? Because I think I might have just missed something. Because my understanding is that. Um, at least from what I've, from the examples of asthmic writing I've seen, at least in the in the in the, in the contemporary writing I've seen, actually embraces technology and for its production. So I just sort of wondered what specific asthmic um, practices are you looking at um, that you see as being particularly resistant? Yeah. So I think we could take the example of emoji. So that's a form of writing without language. And it looks like it's gestural, facial, and so forth. Uh, but emoji are most usually encountered in digital form, a form of digital communication. So underlying the emoji that appears at the surface of inscription are all those layers of code that make it possible to generate that symbol on the screen or in the email or whatever it is uh, that one is using. And so, if you want to say the emoji are a form of asymic writing, which is now pervasive in the culture, that is a form of asymic writing which already incorporates the digital into it, and therefore incorporates not just embodied and gestural language, but all the layers of code that render us partially illiterate. And so the examples that I was giving here of asymic writing are importantly handwriting. So they're not produced through the digital uh, replication of code. They're produced through the pen drawing on paper. And so in that form, they're more easily understood as a form of resistance to the techno-linguistic regime than something like emoji would be. Where emoji have this double kind of balance <coughs> pointing towards some kind of gestural and body communication, but at the same time doing so through digital means. And so in that sense, they're like the captcha of technology. They're carrying a double message, both about conveying resistance to alphabetic language, but also relying on code to do so. <clears throat> 
very confused. Is it going on? Yes. I'm very confused. Uh, it seems like you're saying that the, the language is one thing, but the underlying of the language is another thing, or the, or the basis uh, on which the language rests is another thing. Uh, I, I know, I have friends, when they go somewhere, there's a GPS that tells them where to go. Me, I have maps, but that's, <laughs> I'm an old guy. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm asking is, you, you seem to be talking about the language that we use, and then you talk about the language that the language uses to talk to the machines and that kind of thing. Uh, as, as a uh, as a means of uh, being facilitated, or is it a means of uh, enslaving? Question. Facilitated or enslaved? Is that what you said? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, well, I would say it's both. Mm. That. Um, Take you speaking into the microphone or me speaking into the microphone. So the microphone is taking an analog signal, your sound waves that you're generating through your vocal cords. It's sending it into some complicated electronics, amplifying it through the speaker. So as a result of that electronic transmission, we're able to hear you in the back row where maybe otherwise we could not. At the same time, speaking through a microphone distorts the way that you can speak. You have to somewhat space your words. You have to speak more distinctly. You have to speak in a certain rhythm. That might not be your natural way of speaking if we were standing face to face. So you're being constrained by that technical capability. At the same time, the technical capability is making it possible for you to do something you might not be able to do without the technical people. And that's exactly our present situation in what I'm calling the techno-linguistic regime. It has all kinds of capabilities that we use daily that allow us to perform functions we couldn't perform without it. At the same time, it's imposing certain constraints on us that are uh, perhaps algorithmic constraints of various kinds, of which we may only be dimly or maybe not aware at all. And uh, it's also disciplining us in the certain kinds of usage, as opposed to other usage we might use if, if we didn't have those constraints. So we could, we could multiply that example <coughs> thousandfold over. It's our everyday condition. Turn our devices back on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank KBL for a great